Well, this morning we're continuing through our summer series called uh, Real Faith in a Messy World. And this entire summer we've been working through a 2,000-year-old letter written by the Apostle Paul to a group of Christians living in a city called Corinth. And as we've seen, the issues that they were facing living as Christians in that community are the same issues that we face living in our culture. Because there's so many similarities between their culture and ours. They, too, were affluent. They had all kinds of options of things to do. They lived in a culture that was increasingly immoral. And so they had the question, how do we live out our faith in this messy world? And Paul, the Apostle Paul, is writing to address many of those issues. And uh, I was talking, actually, with a friend of, a pastor friend of mine this week, and he was telling me about many of the issues that he was facing in his own church community. And it just struck me that every issue that he, we were talking about is addressed in this letter. People problems, uh, issues of conflict between people, um, sexual problems and sexual immorality and marriage issues and divorce issues and singleness and idolatry. All of it is right here in this letter. And today, as we come to yet another passage, we hit yet another issue that the church in Corinth was facing. And again, at first uh, look, it looks like this isn't really relevant to me, but I'll tell you, if you are a follower of Jesus... This is going to intersect with you right where you live because it's about what is central to our faith. And so I'm going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If you have a Bible or a Bible app, you want to find 1 Corinthians chapter 11, go ahead and do that. But I'm going to start in verse 17 where the Apostle Paul begins this section by saying, In the following directives, in the following instructions, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. So this is not a good start to this section. Paul says, we got to talk about something. i got some instructions for you, and it's not good news. I am not happy with the way you are functioning. I've heard some things that are happening in your community, and as your pastor, I have to tell you, I am deeply grieved by these things, and they have to do with your gatherings. When you come together as the church, things are happening among you that make it worse that you get together than if you didn't get together at all. So what are the issues that the church is facing? Well, actually, in this verse, Paul is starting a new section of his letter where he's going to be talking about the gathering of the church for the next several chapters. The end of chapter 11, 12, 13, and 14 are all focused on the gathering. But here in chapter 11, he's going to talk about one issue in particular. Verse 18. In the first place, he says, because I'm going to talk about a lot of things about your gathering, but in the first place... I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. And you're like, what what does he mean there? Well, what did Jesus say is the one way that we could tell if we're we're his followers? If we love one another. And so in in the church, if there's divisions, clearly that is not uh, getting God's approval. But it's when we are together that we could see that we have the approval of God when we live in unity. He goes on to say, so then. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. So what's going on? While there's division in the church... There's factions in the church, particularly around the celebration of the Lord's Supper. What is the Lord's Supper? Well, I was was fascinated to learn that this is the only place that this phrase is actually used in the Bible. Of course, it talks about the the, the communion meal, the the Last Supper, and other places in the Bible. But this is the only time that this phrase is used. And we may be tempted to confuse it with what we're going to do here in a little bit by eating the itty-bitty pieces of bread and drinking the teensy-weensy cups of juice. That is a part of what he's talking about, but he's talking about something bigger. The Lord's Supper, we could see in this context, they would come together and they would enjoy a full meal together. Everyone would bring food and they would, they would enjoy this full meal together and they would laugh together and would talk about what Jesus was doing in their lives together. And then toward the end of that meal, then they would celebrate the Lord's Supper by breaking the bread and taking of the cup, symbolizing the body and the blood of Christ given at the cross. Think of the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, you know, when Jesus shared the full Passover meal with his disciples and then he broke the bread and drank the cup. That's what they were, that's what they were doing. And this fellowship meal was so vitally important to the life of the church and to the witness of the church because they lived in an incredibly segregated society, much like our society, where you had 
slaves and you had free men. You had rich people and you had poor people. You had Jews and you had Gentiles. You had masters and you had servants. They were very, very segregated. But Jesus died to make them one. To, to create this new reality called the kingdom of God, where they would put aside their differences, and under the blood of Christ, under the love of Christ, they would come together, and they would love one another, and they would live together in community, where the rich would eat with and share their food with the poor, where masters would sit down at the same table as slaves, where Jews and Gentiles and every other nationality, every skin color would come together and would live together in community. This is what the, the, the body of Christ was intended to be. This is what they are being called into and how important that witness would be to the Corinthian culture, but this is not what they're experiencing in Corinth. As they come together to celebrate the cross of Christ, the Lord's Supper, there is division among them. The Jews are hanging out with the Jews and the Gentiles with the Gentiles and the rich with the rich and the poor with the poor and the white with the white and the black with the black. More than that, the rich people were bringing all the food to potluck and they weren't sharing. They were having their own private suppers there. Just imagine the scene. You come to a church potluck, and the people who brought all the food, they're just saving it for themselves, while the poor sit there, and Paul says, in humiliation, they look on with nothing. And to make matters even worse, people are coming and getting drunk, treating this like some kind of pagan festival. Paul's not pleased. You know, and I was trying to think, how do we kind of how does this intersect with where we are as a church? Do we have divisions among us? What does potluck look like, look like for us? And I'm, I mean, we experienced a little bit of it today. I was at this cafe table over here, and I looked over at this cafe, cafe table over here where the college kids were, and they had all this food on the table, and we had a pitcher of water. I'm like, but, sir, I mean, have you ever been to the potluck where... You, all the food is put out, and you're looking at how much food there is and how many people there are, and you're like, this is not adding up. Like, there's not enough food to go around, and you're like thinking of praying, like, Lord, multiply this, like the, you know, the multiplication of the fish and the loaves. But then as soon as the potluck starts, you got certain people that just jump to the front of the line, and they just start heaping food onto their plates with no thought whatsoever of the people that are behind them. They just know that they are going to have a good meal right now. And then you're like halfway through the line after half the people have gone. You're just kind of trying to scrape some things out of the cottage cheese loaf casserole dish, trying to scrape together a few crumbs for a meal. I have a personally deeply held belief that if you go first in a potluck line, you have a responsibility to the people behind you, right? That you are thinking of the people behind you, making sure that everyone's going to have something to eat, which is why I never go first. I don't want that responsibility. I back clean up, right? But more importantly, are there divisions among us? When we come together, are there divisions among us? Or when we come together, do we intentionally step out of the circle of the people that we're comfortable with to, to reach out to the person who is maybe new or feeling awkward or left out and making sure that they're included in? Are, are we mingling together, sitting at the table, young and old? Are the Asians sitting down at the table with the Latinos and the Latinos with the Caucasians and the Caucasians with the African Americans? Are we integrated as the body of Christ because this is the intention? This is what Jesus died to create. This is the greatest witness of the power of the gospel to the world. Is our love for one another despite differences. But this is not what they were experiencing in Corinth. And so Paul goes back to the beginning and he tells them, this is the purpose of the Lord's Supper. I want to explain this to you again. I've already explained it to you once. I'm going to explain it to you again. And he says in verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. Now, he starts with that because he is telling them about the importance of what he's about to share with them. This isn't from Paul. This came from the Lord Jesus himself. He commanded this. He passed on to the apostles, one of whom was Paul, what is to be done and how it's to be done and why it's to be done. And this is why this is so important still to this day. I, passed, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus... On the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So Paul, again, he's reminding them about the purpose of the Lord's Supper why we actually celebrate it. And the bottom line he's saying is, is the purpose of the Lord's Supper is to rehearse the centrality of, of the cross to our faith. 
And I use the verb there, rehearse, because it's more than just remembering. It's an actual acting out, an entering into, right? We become a part of the drama when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, and we rehearse the centrality of the cross to our faith. Simply put, there is no Christianity without a cross. Think about this. This is the only commemorative act that Jesus told us, commanded us to keep, was a a remembrance of his death. He could have told us to commemorate his birth, which we do, and that's fine, but he didn't tell us to do that. He could have told us to remember his life or his teachings or to, to build a large altar to the miracles that he performed right there on the Sea of Galilee. He didn't tell us to do that. He didn't even tell us to commemorate his resurrection, again, which we do, and that is fine. The only thing he told us to commemorate was his death, letting us know the centrality of the cross, the centrality of his death to our faith. Now, just a side note, Jesus never said how often we should do this. He didn't make that clear, but he did make it clear that it should be periodic because he said, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, giving the sense that there would be some kind of regularity to it. Some churches do it every week, some once a month. You know, we do it about once a quarter. Jesus didn't tell us how often, but he did tell us how long to do it. He said, until he comes. That until Jesus comes again, followers of Jesus, this is what we are called to do, to commemorate his death through the celebration of the Lord's Supper. But even more important than, than uh, commemorating this, or rehearsing the, the centrality of the cross to our faith, the purpose of the Lord's Supper also is to rehearse the purpose of Jesus' death. You know, he speaks about his death, and he uses this term, the, the new covenant. We wonder, what is that? But really, it, when understood... It is this amazing statement that Jesus makes. It speaks of of an initiative that God takes to enter into a new kind of relationship with us. You see, about 2,000 years before Jesus said these words, God had approached a man named Abraham, and he entered into covenant relationship with him. He made an agreement with him. He said, Abraham, you follow me, you have faith in me, and I will bless you. I will bless your offspring, and I'll bless the whole world through you. And Abraham, Abraham agreed. Several hundred years later, God reaffirmed that covenant with Abraham's offspring, the Israelites, after he freed them from slavery in Egypt, where he came to them and again ratified this covenant. And we're told that on Sinai, that covenant between God's people and God was ratified with blood. It says in Exodus chapter 24, Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you. So the point is, is that when God makes a covenant with people, it needs to be ratified with blood. And we can go into why that's important. There are good reasons for it. We don't have time to unpack that this morning. But really, we need to know that blood must be shed. Blood of a sacrifice must be shed to make this covenant. Now, hundreds of years go by. And while the people had entered into this covenant, they forgot about it. They forgot about God. They rebelled against him. They broke the covenant. And so about the 7th century B.C., God came to a prophet by the name of Jeremiah. And he says this amazing thing. He says, the time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. We already made one covenant. We're going to make a new one. Why? Well, it won't be like the covenant I made with their forefathers because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them. I was good to them. I gave them every, I kept my end of the bargain. I blessed them, but they broke the covenant. So we're going to make a new covenant. What's the new covenant going to be like, Lord? He's going to tell us. This is the covenant I will make with them. I will put my laws in their minds and write it on their hearts. In other words, I will come into you. I will fill you with my spirit. I will change you from the inside out, giving you not only the desire to live right, but the power to live right, to live in good standing and faithful to God. More than that, I will be their God and they will be my people. I will establish a new family. I will be your God and you will be together as my people. And finally, he says, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. So we can see three parts here to the new covenant. Number one, that God is going to fill us with the Holy Spirit, giving us the power and the desire to live faithfully for him. Number two, that he's going to call us together as his people, making a new community of faith, a new family. And number three, he's going to forgive our sins and remember them no more. So about 600 years, 700 years later, a Galilean peasant comes along named Jesus, and the night before he is crucified, he says, in effect, that covenant that God spoke about 700 years ago is about to be ratified, and the blood that's going to seal that covenant is my blood. That tomorrow, my body is going to be torn apart. I'm going to be whipped. I'm going to be flogged. My hands and feet are going to be nailed to a cross, even though I'm innocent and even though I am God. And I'm going to die, and I'm going to shed my blood, 
in order to seal this new way of approaching God, this new covenant. This is Jesus' view of his death, of his own death. This is what he's teaching through the Lord's Supper. He's saying that my death is going to bring you back into relationship with God the Father. That before you were separated from him by your sin, but now you are reconciled to him through my shed blood and through my death. And while before you were separated from one another by your sin, and you were Jew and Gentile, rich and poor, and Republican and Democrat, and white and black, and Latino and Asian, but now I am going to make you one, bring you together through my shed blood as my new people. You see, we need to see that not only are we reconciled to God, but we're reconciled to one another because we come into this covenant together. That when I realize my sin, that I have so deeply offended God and his law, I come to the foot of the cross, and I stand there in complete conviction of my need of salvation. And you come when you realize that you have offended God, and you come as you realize, and you come as you realize your sin, and we all stand there at the foot of the cross together, and there we are on equal ground. It doesn't matter how much money I have. Doesn't matter the color of my skin, doesn't matter how much education I have, we all stand there deserving death, all stand there needing grace if we're going to be saved. And Jesus calls us together into this new family. He saves us together and calls us into this new community that He died to bring into effect. Where we look at the cross and we say, if that's how God sacrifices for me, if that's how much God loves me, if that's how much God gives for me, then certainly I will sacrifice for you. I will give to you. I will love you as he has loved me. This is the meaning of the Lord's Supper. And this is why the behavior and the actions of the Corinthians being divisive, being selfish, as they are celebrating the cross of Christ, was inexcusable. Paul says, I'm not pleased with you. He goes on in verse 27. He says, So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of Christ. If you eat of it in an unworthy manner, you are sinning against the cross of Christ. Now we get really nervous here. We're like, what does that mean, an unworthy manner? And I've talked to a lot of Christians like, I'm not worthy to take part in the Lord's Supper, therefore I don't. All of us are unworthy. When you understand the holiness of God and, and how far we've fallen from that, all of us are unworthy. We all come the same way, by grace. This isn't talking about, oh, I'm unworthy, I can't come. It's talking about the way we approach. And if we approach in an unworthy way, which by the, the context of the Corinthian sin was not recognizing that we're one. And me living just for myself rather than putting you first and not seeing that the cross of Christ should impact how I treat and love others, if I miss that, and I come harboring resentment and bitterness and hatred and anger and prejudice and racism, then I am celebrating the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. He goes on to say, Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. This is another one where people get really nervous. They're like, okay, i got to examine myself. And I've talked, again, to so many Christians who when they come you know, into the Lord's Supper, they're like, oh, i got to examine myself. And we think this means some kind of like a, a morbid introspection where we've got to search our heart and look for any unknown sin and make sure it's confessed, make sure I've made it right, and, and all of this. And so, again, a lot of Christians will totally avoid the Lord's Supper, because they're like, I, maybe there's some sin I don't know about in my life, and then I can't come to the table, when that's not at all what Paul is writing about. This isn't talking about the private sin in my heart. It's talking about the corporate sin among us of not discerning the body. That's why he says, those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ. What is the body of Christ? It's the church. If I come into this thing, thing is all about me. If I come into this thing and I can't stand my brother and I, you know, I'm, I'm not willing to make up, I'm not even willing to talk about loving this person, I need to do some self-examination. I need to check my heart and make sure that I am expressing and reflecting the spirit of the cross, that extravagant love, that complete selflessness that Jesus showed, that's what we are called to. And of course, there's even grace in that. But I need to be willing to examine myself and say, do I have a problem with somebody? Is there someone I need to make up with that's in this room? Am I harboring prejudice, racism, division, and unwillingness to connect with the people around me? 
this is what it means to examine ourselves. And I would encourage you, examine yourself. Do you discern the body? Do you see that we are one? Do you believe that God has made us one, that he died, Jesus died to make us one? And as he has died for me, as he has given to me, I am to love and give to you. Paul wraps the passage up by saying this. just makes it real clear. This is the bottom line. He says, so then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat. Everybody say it. Together. That's the point. When you gather to eat, all eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home. Have a sandwich if you don't think there's going to be enough food. Don't like hoard food at the potluck so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. That is the key word. That is what Jesus wants for us. It's what Paul's his pastor heart wants for his church, that we would come together. Jesus died so we could be together with God and we could be together with one another. He died to create a new reality, a new kingdom on earth where there is no division but only love, where there's no separation but only togetherness. So let me encourage you. Examine your heart. Are you harboring something at somebody? Is there anything that you just need to confess right now? Lord, I want to discern the body. I want to see that we are one. You know, fortunately, when Jesus instituted the, Lord, the Lord's Supper that first night, that first Passover, he gave us another way to examine ourselves. John, the apostle, tells the story in his gospel, the 13th chapter. He says that during the meal, or right before the meal, that Jesus got up from the table, and he went around, and he took a basin and a towel, and he began to wash the feet of his disciples, demonstrating to them what this new reality, what this new community looked like. I need you guys to become servants for one another. I'm about to give my life for you. I need you to serve one another as I am going to serve you. And after he washed all of their feet, he said to them, as I have served you, I want you to serve one another, and you will be blessed as you do. You know, at New Day, we actually take his words literally. Go figure, I know, right? Listen to Jesus, take his words literally. We actually, before we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we actually literally wash one another's feet because we believe it is an opportunity for us to do some self-examination. Is my heart in a place where I am willing to be a servant, where I can discern the body, that it's not just about me, but because of the cross, I could be about you, that I could put you first. And so in a minute, we're actually going to give you an opportunity to find a partner, if you're willing, and wash their feet. We're going to have some water. We're going to have some towels. You're just going to kneel before somebody and say, let me serve you. I'm going to wash your feet. You're going to wash my feet. And we're going to take the position of a servant and love one another the way Jesus loved us. Now, I would encourage you, again, to examine yourself. If there's someone that you need to reconcile with, why not seek them out? Say, can I just wash your feet? Can I serve you? Maybe it's a husband and a wife who had an argument on the way to to church today. I know that never happens, right? (laughs) Or maybe it's a parent and a child, a child with a parent. Maybe it's two people on the same ministry team. Maybe there were words exchanged or friends that haven't talked in a while. This is a great opportunity to reconcile. I'll tell you what. If you are a guest here with us today and this is the first time you've experienced this, please feel free to just sit and observe if you want. This will take about eight or ten minutes. Then we're going to come back together. We're going to finish up by taking the body and the blood of Christ. But if you would like to lean in and, and give this a shot, I don't think that you'll be sorry that you did. But right now I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask you to separate, find a partner, get some water, a towel, and we'll come back together to finish our service together. Father God, we thank you for the cross of Christ that demonstrates your heart of love for us. How far you would be willing to go to be reconciled to us, how much you would give up, how much you would sacrifice, the pain that you would go through for our sake. As you have loved us, may we love one another. As you have given to us, may we give to one another. As you have served us, may we serve one another. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.